You know, it's hard to uh, believe that we're in December already. You know, this month holds a lot of anticipation for a lot of people. People thinking about uh, the Christmas season, being able to get with family and friends. But they also think about the new season that's coming right around the corner. January's coming and a new year, 2016. It's hard to think that we're already here. You know, I think back when I was a kid, you know, we heard all kinds of th things about the future. People talked about what, what they believed it would be, you know, in 2010, 2015, and now we're looking at 2016. But, you know, the words that have been spoken before us, you know, we think about it and we, and we buy into it. You know, they promise a lot of things. You know, when I heard as a child that, you know, by this time we're going to be in time travel, I thought it would be kind of a cool thing, but we're not quite there yet. You know, as a young man, I thought by now we'd have the cure for cancer. They talked about it all the time. You know, I thought by now we would have uh, these robots that kind of do things for us and kind of hang out with us, and that's not quite where we're at. But technology has advanced, and in the last 10 years we really look at that and we say, man, it really has advanced, but not like they promised, not like we had hoped. So when you look at where we're at in our life, we look at this journey of faith that we've taken. We look at where our world is at. We consider all the things that have been said and spoken. You know, we, we walk by words of encouragement, but also words that have been promised to us. Now, I don't know when or where, but I think all of us have been uh, in a position where we've been promised something. Even as a child, maybe you were promised something by a parent or uh, a neighbor or a friend or a teacher. And somewhere along the line, that, that promise was probably broken. And we kind of look at this and say, you know, what good is a promise if you don't carry it through? You know, what good is our word if we don't carry that through? It's an essence of integrity. But, you know, when we see this, this process where people will give you a promise and then they don't fulfill that promise, the value of their word diminishes. And I know I'm as guilty as, as any other parent. I've promised my kids a lot of things. You know, maybe uh, promise them, that, hey, this afternoon we're going to do this, that, or the other. And then the afternoon comes and guess what? We don't do it. But, Dad, you promised. And, and I look at that, and they remind me of those things. And it's sitting there going, okay, how many times have we been on the receiving end of that? When we've been promised something, and it never came to be. How did that leave you? It left you in a, a point of disappointment. And see, God doesn't want us to live in a disappointed life. And the promise that he's giving to us is one that we can put our life into. We don't have to be afraid of him uh, pulling out and saying, well, I did promise it, but there is no but with God. He says, when my word is spoken and I give you the word of promise, it will be as I have spoken it. That's what we have today. That's what we get to live in. That's what we get to celebrate is the promise of the light of the world. God has promised us this light and it's coming to us and it's all around us. But he doesn't want us to live in a, a spirit of disappointment. He wants us to live in that truth. Now, no matter what this day looks like, December 6th, 2015, you know, it was no surprise to God what this day will hold. Even in the next few hours, God knows. You know, God looks at time a little bit different than we do. He's able to look at the beginning and the end and see it all at the same time. Now, we can't wrap our minds around that, how that's possible, but it is. He's able to see creation, and he's able to see the return of Christ, and he's able to see it as one event. But for us, we get... Uh, thrown back and forth, don't we, by circumstances. We want to live in the promise. We've been given the promise of his return, and we're to live in that joy and that spirit until he returns, but yet it's sometimes difficult, isn't it, to live in that promise. We wonder, is he coming back? Is he going to do what he had promised to do? And why is that? It's because we identify with our nature, our sin nature, where we disappoint, where we fall short, but God doesn't fall short, and God doesn't disappoint. So when he gives us a promise, we can count on it. And we know that it's going to be there today, tomorrow, and forever. That's why we celebrate this season, the light of the world that he has given us. Now, last week, we talked about the prophet Isaiah. We talked about how he was prophesying what was to come, the birth of Christ. Now, we saw this from the very beginning of time in the book of Genesis. We talked about it last week, that it didn't take very long for the darkness of sin to find its way into the world. But then Jesus was spoken of in Genesis, prophesied about his coming redemptive powers. And we're called to live in that promise. But you know, the thing that I love about God is when he says it's going to happen, it will. 
It may not happen exactly the way that we see it, but it will happen exactly the way that he sees it. And that's what we have to trust in. So as we walk through this journey, and as we talk today about the promised light of Jesus, we can live in the confidence that it's going to be exactly as he has spoken. Now, as we walk through the course of time, God works in humanity in all kinds of wonderful ways. And even though that we have fallen short, even though that we've turned away from Christ time and time again, he continues to pursue us. He continues to live out the promise that has been given to us. That's the beauty of his word. But I want to talk this morning, as we get started, I want to talk to you about the promised sign of God's redemptive plan. The promised sign. It's promised, but yet we were waiting for it. They were waiting for it. You know, as God walked through generation after generation, he saw the darkness come into humanity. And he had a plan of redemption. And that plan of redemption was to bring Christ to us through the house of David. Now, if you don't know what the house of David is, God called out the Israelites as his chosen people. He chose them to bring the lineage of Christ through the house of David. And he was able to walk them through, but yet because of the darkness of the world, it found its way into us. And we became corrupted by the sin of the world. But that didn't change that God had chosen the Israelites to be his represent, representation of love and promise. But I want to talk this morning about three prophecies, things that were foretold about Christ. But I want you to see that these were foretold in those moments of corruption, in those moments of despair, when nobody believed and their faith was faltering, the word of God came to life and reminded them of the promise that was yet to come. So this first prophecy that I want to talk about this morning comes out of the book of Numbers. And what is happening here is the Israelites, they're coming out of Egypt. They've been captive in Egypt as slaves. And these are God's chosen people. And he's saying, I'm going to bring you out. I'm going to free you. I'm going to give you what I promised. And he started leading them to where? The promised land. And as he was leading them there, they were met with opposition. They were met with all kinds of distractions and challenges in their journey of faith. But they continued to be faithful. They were unified. They saw God for who he was. And they began to see victory. They came up against the Amorites. Victorious. They came up against all kinds of other oppression. And they were victorious. But as they were traveling towards the promised land. They landed right next door to the Moabites. Moab. And this king, Balak. He looked at them. And he says, I've heard of you. I've heard of you Israelites, those that came out of Egypt, and I don't think I want you in my area. I think maybe you'll cause some trouble, eat up all of our resources. I want you to get out of here. But he also knew the power that was behind them. So he wasn't going to take it on himself. So this King Balak, he, he thought and considered, and he says, you know what? I think I have an angle here. There was a man named Balaam, okay? And this man named Balaam was living in his native land which was real close to where the Israelites were at. But this individual, he had some special gifts, real special gifts. And it was interesting to me as I read this and looked at this, because Balaam, he, he, he dabbled in sorcery. He was able to cast curses on people, and it came to be as exactly as he'd said. But Scripture also tells us that he was also gifted by God to prophesy, to be able to commu communicate with God in a very intimate way. So I'm trying to walk this through, and I'm sitting there going, okay, non-Jew, gifted by God, and how's God going to use this? How's this going to work out? Well, anyway, the Israelites were there, camped out. King Balak says, I summon Balaam. And they sent money and tried to convince him to come to curse the Israelites. And when he came, he says, you know what? Why don't you just spend the night? Let me go see if God will talk to me. This Balaam had a healthy fear of God. He encountered God in a very special way, so he had a reverent fear for God, not meaning that he always wanted to follow God, but enough to be able to listen to him intently. And what God said to Balaam was this, don't go with these people. In fact, do not curse those that I have blessed. Talking about the Israelites. So he goes back and he says, I can't go with you. Tell King Balak, I'm not interested, don't care about your riches. But then he sent him back and he says, no. I want you to come. I'll give you the riches of my palace if you come and curse the people of Israel. Now, at this point, God says, go ahead and go. 
I'm not happy about it, but go ahead and go, but don't speak anything that I have not given to you. So he went. And King Balak took him out to the region and said, look over here. See the Israelites? These are the people that I want you to curse. Give them a curse, and then that'll be, I'll be done with them. So he says, you go ahead and set up your altars. I'm going to go encounter God, and I'll tell you what he has to say. So Balaam comes back this first time, and he begins to speak in front of the king. And as the king begins to listen to this, he's sitting there going, wait a minute. This doesn't sound like a curse. This sounds like a blessing. And he says, what are you doing? I called you here to curse the people of Israel, but yet you're blessing them. He says, do I need to remind you that I cannot speak what has, not, that what has been given to me? I have to give from God. He says, well, all right, let's go over here now. Let's look at the folks over here. These Israelites, curse them. He says, set up your altars. I'll go talk to God again. And he did it again. And he came back and he began to share what God had spoken. And then once again, he says, why do you keep blessing them when all I've asked is you curse them? He says, I can't speak against God. He says, one more time. I'm going to take you over here in the middle. If this pleases God, maybe he'll let you curse Israel. He says, fine, I'll go talk one more time. And he came back a third time, and again, it was the blessing, not the curse. And in that moment, King Bailey says, get out of here. He says, I was going to give you the riches of my palace, but your Lord cost you everything. Balaam looked at him and he says, you don't get this, do you? I'm the prophet. Let me give you a word from God. He says, these Israelites, they're God's chosen people. He says, let me tell you what the Israelites are going to do to you and your people. You interested to hear what it is? <laughs> In Numbers, the 24th chapter, verse 17, this is a prophecy of the coming Messiah. Listen to this. I see him, but not here and now. I perceive him, but far in the distant future. A star will rise from Jacob. A scepter will emerge from Israel. It will crush the foreheads of Moab's people, cracking the skulls of the people of Sheath. Does that sound like a Christmas story to you? But it's true. The prophecy of Jesus was, let me tell you what the Savior of the world is going to do to the darkness of this world. It's going to crush your skull. Now, that was in that moment, and God gave him victory, but he was talking about the coming Messiah. No one will stand up against God's chosen people. It's not possible, because when God wills it, nobody can derail it. That's the beauty of this. But that's quite the prophecy, isn't it, to live in that. So the Israelites, for the moment, had this great victory, and they were able to move through that unified, together but let me tell you about another prophecy of the messiah that came because see the breakdown of our faith is evident and we see this all throughout humanity that we are like connected to god and then we're disconnected and we're connected to god and we're disconnected same thing was there with the israelites they would rise and fall in their faith and god would get so frustrated with them he says i have promised you the coming messiah i need you to live in that promise understand that light but they didn't. They didn't. Next prophecy comes from Isaiah. This is a time when the Israelites had kind of moved down in their journey. And they kind of move into what's called the 12 tribes of Israel. It wasn't just a unified body now. They were kind of breaking down and kind of giving them territory to oversee. But in this movement, corruption began to come. Kind of a power struggle. My tribe's better than your tribe. And that was what was kind of going on. Rather than focusing on God, the tribes of Israel began to be combative with one another. In fact, to a point where they said, you know what? We don't like this whole thing, the, this house of David. We're divided. It's kind of like Ohio State and Michigan. House divided. <laughs> but what was happening is there was only two tribes out of the 12 that says we're loyal to the house of David, which was the house that was going to bring forth the Messiah. It was the tribe of Judah. And Benjamin. Now they didn't like that, and they started to go at each other. And the prophet Isaiah had already spoke about this. We saw this last week. He says, "You're in a time and a place where you think wrong is right and wrong, right is wrong. You guys got this all mixed up. I'm the answer, but you think you're the answer." So all this confusion was happening, and Isaiah had to step in and help them to realize what was happening. 
They wanted to take out the tribe of Judah because they knew that that's where Christ was to come from. So what was happening is some of the tribes gathered together their alliances and said, hey, we're going to take out the tribe of Judah and we'll, do, we'll share all the resources. But they didn't just stay within their tribes. They went outside of their tribes and, and found an outside alliance. King Reason from Aram. So they started going outside of Israel and saying, the problem is even bigger than us. But God spoke to the king of Judah, Ahaz. He was terrified. He'd heard all these rumors. And the prophet says, this day is never going to come. What they think they're going to do to you will not happen because God is going to be victorious in this. You do not need to fear. But he was still terrified because in our human nature, when you get all these people coming up against you, you get terrified. But see, that's what's happening in the churches in America today. God wanted all the tribes of Israel to stay unified, to stay focused on God. But yet, they had their own agenda. We look at the churches in America. You know, we, we find brokenness even in our own church. But why can't we even be unified within our own churches in the city of Troy? You know, we kind of do our own thing. And see, if Satan can keep us segregated out, separated, then we cannot have the impact that God intended. So that was what was happening with Israel here. But the prophet Isaiah, he comes and he says, King Ahaz, I know you're fearful. Ask for a sign from God so that you can be confident that this will not happen, that you'll be victorious. King Ahaz says, no, I'm not going to test God. I'm not going to ask for a sign. I'm not going to do that. And the prophet Isaiah said, you know what? That's pretty foolish. When you have the invitation to have a sign from God, wouldn't you want to see it? I would. But he chose not to. But the prophet Isaiah said, you know what, I'm going to give you one anyway. I'm going to give you a sign to let you know that you will be victorious in God. And we find this in Isaiah 7, probably the most familiar prophetic word about the coming Messiah. It says this in verse 14. He says, all right then, the Lord himself will give you the sign. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and we will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. He wanted them to know that God is with us now. Even though I'm prophesying what is yet to come in Christ, you have God now, King Ahaz. You do not need to be afraid of the enemy. And it's sad that the enemy was God's chosen people, fighting amongst themselves. But yet victory was there for them. But we move from there, and we realize that even though we can be part of the problem, we can never derail the redemptive plan of Jesus Christ. We cannot, because God has put it in place and is making motion through our lives. But then we move forward, and the third prophetic word that comes from Jeremiah. And what was happening here, can you see the progression? Israel's unified. Now they have 12 tribes, and they're divided, and they're fighting. Now in Jeremiah, they're being disciplined for all the evil kings that now are leading God's people down the wrong paths. All of them, even the house of David, the tribe of Judah. Corruption found its way even there. And see, that's why I'm saying the spirit of darkness is so strong. And the evidence finds its way even in the purest setting and corrupts it. So the progression is there and God saw it, but he says, I will not give up. My promise is still true. The coming Messiah is still on its way. But what was happening was Jeremiah saw the breakdown of the tribe of Judah. That's where Christ was to come from. And Jesus was to be the one prophesied. But God steps in and he says, let me tell you something. Even though you're breaking up the tribe of Judah, I, the Lord, will take up a remnant for myself from my flock. And we'll assure that this will happen. So even though we can be part of the problem and the movement of the faith, God says, I will continue to use even your brokenness for the good of the kingdom of God. That's the hope that we have in Christ. Because it's not up to us. It's never been up to us. It's always been up to Christ. And he is the perfect gift of salvation. But that's what he wanted them to know. But then a challenge came to them, and, and they wanted to bring back the unity. He says, while you wait for this promise, I need you to be that remnant of faith. 
Now, we see all throughout Scripture that there was times when they were faithful and many times when they were not. In church, there's going to be seasons when we are faithful and there's going to be seasons when we're not. But thank God Almighty that it's not based on what we do. It's based on the grace of God. But he's called us to be holy, to be set apart, so that we can be part of the light of the world, part of the remnant of faith that he's called us to be. So why we wait for the Messiah, this prophesied child of God? How do you think they did? Well, let's ask the question, how are we doing? You know, they had only an idea of what was to come. Church, we get to live in the reality of what, what has already been. Christ has already come. We're not waiting for him to come. We're waiting for his return. But while we're waiting for his return, we have the reality of Christ. They did not. It was just a prophecy of something that was yet to come, a hope, a promise that they were living in. We have the reality. So why do we struggle waiting for his return? Why aren't we so faithful that we're moving the mountains that are before us? Why aren't we seeing this, the evidence that is before us? You know, <laughs> I was one of those kids. I don't do real well at waiting. And when it came to Christmas time, I was that kid that always looked for Christmas gifts. And I always found them. They were never good at hiding. I always found them. I'd get my pocket knife out and I'd cut the tape and pull it back and see what I got. You know, I always did that. But there was one year that I couldn't find the present. Maybe my dad was on to me. I don't know. Maybe put him in the trunk of the car or something. I don't know. But I remember that night, I didn't know what I was getting. And there was an anticipation of what that morning was going to be, that gift that I didn't know about. Now, see, that's where they had to live, the Israelites. They didn't know fully what Christ was. They had heard, had some understanding, but they didn't get to experience his spirit as we do. They didn't get to experience his birth as we do. We didn't get to they didn't get to experience the promise as deep as we have. But yet they waited in anticipation of that morning. Church, we have the gift. It's already been unwrapped, and we have been given that freely. Then why do we pass it and put it aside? We have the gift of Christ and the birth of Jesus. But I want to talk about the words of the prophet. They were more than just a sign. More than a sign, but it was the reality of God's love. You know, it's one thing to talk about it, one thing to promise, and that's where they lived, but we get to see the reality of God's love in Christ. We don't have to wait for that anymore. It's there. In fact, I want you to turn with me to Matthew. In Matthew, this is the fulfillment of the prophecy that we just read in Isaiah 7. They were able to live in the fulfillment of the prophecy. They didn't have to wait any longer. But it takes an interesting twist to this. It says, this is how Jesus, the Messiah, was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her fiancé, was a good man, and he did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now, when you hear that, think about what was going on. The prophecy of hundreds of years coming to be in that moment. They were touched and experienced the power of the Holy Spirit in that moment. I mean, think about it. She conceived a child by the Holy Spirit. She was touched. And you know, today, that new life that was brought into her, that new life can still be in us. When we are touched by the Holy Spirit, new life begins within each of us. It's different. We're not giving birth to a child, but we're giving birth to new life in Christ. And that's what we're to be. We're to be that new light, that fresh wind, that Spirit of God living in us. But don't you think this was a confusing time of faith too? I mean, come on, when did this happen? This is the first time. Yeah, it was miraculous, I get it. 
But who had ever heard of a miraculous conception? It didn't happen. So I'm sure Mary's sitting there going, okay, I hear what you're saying. I got this child inside of me from the Holy Spirit, which is, I can't wrap my mind around this. Then you got Joseph sitting there going, okay, how did this happen? I've never heard about this. And and I know that he's going through his mind, uh, I want to believe, I want to trust, but yet in my mind and my heart, Mary, who have you been with? This doesn't make any sense. How can you be with child? Because I have not been with you. So he had this confusing steps of faith. And sometimes the promises that God calls us to live in, we may not have full understanding. But we have to choose to trust and say, I may not know all the ins and outs of this, God, but I'm choosing to trust the promises that I've seen throughout my life, throughout the word, throughout the generations of those that have gone before me. I choose to believe. And that's where we found Joseph. He finally reached that point. Well, God had to speak to him kind of in a loud voice, in a dream of all. And he was able to hear God speak and say, Joseph, take her as your wife. This is from the Holy Spirit. Trust me in this. I don't know how you get there to fully trust God in that kind of manner. But he did. And he was obedient in that. Fulfillment of prophecy. Obedience to what was happening. But in that moment, church, you see this? They're fulfilling prophecy as it was spoken in that moment. What an exciting time. But church, we get to fulfill. We get to fulfill the prophecy of what the church is to be every day that we come together in the name of Christ. But here's the thing we have to see, church. Our choices of faith, they'll either be a complement to the redemptive plan or or they'll delay it. They won't derail it. I promise you that. But we can be part of the movement of his redemptive plan when we are faithful to the call. Or we can delay it. And church, we've delayed it long enough. We need to buy fully vested into the promise of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. we got to live this out as best we can. You know, we church must be the witnesses to what we have seen in Christ. So that when the church goes into the world, we're able to give them the witness that will give them the reason to come and consider who Christ is. But church, here's the bottom line on this. You can't give something you do not have. If you only know of Christ and you don't know him personally, you cannot give him or her that testimony of faith of what Christ has done radically in your life. You can't. But we've been called to be that witness. So what's this look like? Have you seen the promised light of Jesus? I'm not talking about a Christmas tree. I'm talking about the light of Christ. Have you seen the promised light of Jesus? That's the question that's before us. I'm not talking about the evidence of light. I'm not even talking about the reflection of light. I'm talking about have you seen the source of light? Have you looked at Christ face to face? Have you seen Christ for who he is? And by seeing it, do you realize that you can't live without it? Church, have we reached that point that we're so desperate to see the light of Christ in our lives that every day that we get to wake up and have another day, that we long to know him, long to be consumed by him, praying desperately, God, show me the way. Through your son, give me the light of the world so I don't have to live in this darkness anymore. That night, there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them. Don't be afraid, he said. I bring good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped in strips of cloth, lying in a manger, Suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast host of others, praising God by saying, Glory to God in highest heaven, and peace on earth to those whom God is pleased. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. 
After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. That is the promised light, church. That's what has been given to us. That's what we have to unwrap every day of our lives. As I said last week, it's Christmas morning every day of our lives. And that gift is there for us to take. But in this message is the message of hope, the Savior of the world. It was more than a sign. It was the reality of God's love. But in that moment, they saw the hope for all eternity. They saw the hope for all that were broken and lost and and desperate. They saw the hope for a Savior to change this world as we know it. But there was a sign. It says, you'll know this by a sign. There'll be a baby lying in strips of cloth in a manger. That will be your sign that this is the Savior of the world fulfilling the prophecy that was given. Think about this. God entrusted the Savior of the world as an infant child to the hands of Mary and Joseph, sinners just like us, entrusted everything into their hands. It's no different today, church. We may not be holding a baby, but we're holding the word of God. And he says, carefully, carefully handle the word of God. And he's entrusted that to us, the church, to bring forth the message of Jesus every day of our lives. It's no different. We have that same truth today. But then did you see it? Did you see the praise that came forth from the angels? They were excited to see that Christ had finally come. The reality of the promises here. They began to praise God in the highest. Because why? Because they knew of heaven. And they knew what was being given to humanity. Hope for a lost world. They knew what it meant. Do we? Church, we need to know what this gift really is. And begin to praise him every day. But out of that praise, did you see what happened? It was the response. It was the response of the shepherds. It was immediate. When they saw this, they said, we must go now to Bethlehem to see this Jesus that had been prophesied for so many years. Instant response to the light of the world. But in that response, you know what they became? They became the witness. They're able to look upon Christ and know that this was the one, the one that was promised. He is the one that will change our world, save my life. Those shepherds were the witness. But church, there's no difference today. Every time that we open this word, we witness the love of God. Every time we open this word, we become the witness. What have we heard? What have we seen? And because of that, did you catch what the shepherds did? When they went back to what was their normal life, back to shepherding, They went back glorifying and praising God for what they had seen and heard, telling everybody that would listen, let me tell you about Jesus. Church, we need to be the same way. Every time that we open this word and we hear it, are we going outside these doors and we telling people, anybody that will listen to what we have to say? We have the light of the world. We have hope for today, tomorrow, and forever. This world needs hope. This world needs the love of God, and it has come through Jesus Christ, the light of the world. It was about change. That's what it was. All of this was about change. We invited sin into this world, and God brought the Savior of the world so that we could be free from sin, that we could experience the fullness of what this season is about. There is no despair here. There is only promise. There is only hope for what we hold in the person of Jesus Christ. That's what we need to be celebrating, church. That's what we need to be talking about. And next week, we're going to dive into the impact of this birth. It wasn't just about a birth. The power is in the resurrection. And we're going to talk about the birth, but we're going to talk about the impact that how Jesus changed this world forever. And we are a part of that change. And I'm so glad that he did not leave me alone, that he was willing to pursue me, even when I was like the Israelites, turned away, he continued to pursue me, 
continue to give to me the promise of hope. Church, we have that promise today, and let us celebrate it. This needs to be the best Christmas season we've ever had, not because of what we get, but because of what we get to give, the message of Jesus Christ.